Okay, cool. Um, all right. Uh, well, we're so happy to have Nicole uh, speaking for us tonight um, about her work with Material Innovations Initiative. Um, and uh, what they if they work on, I mean, she's going to tell us, but um, they work on uh, innovation in like um, uh, replacing like animal materials like leather um, with uh, uh, alternatives to um, prevent animal cruelty. Um, and uh, Nicole is going to be telling us about her work there and um, maybe also about her previous work at GFI, the Good Food Institute. Um, all right. Yeah, take it away, Nicole. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here. I feel like I'm, you know, with my people. So this is really nice. Um, yeah, so I mean, my name is Nicole Rowling. I'm the co-founder and executive director of a fairly new nonprofit. Actually, one year anniversary is tomorrow uh, called the, the uh, Material Innovation Initiative. And I'm going to go through what we do a little bit today. And please feel free to interrupt and ask questions because what I found, I've been in the animal protection movement now for decades. I actually turned vegetarian when I was like five. I've been vegan around 15 years. I have two vegan human children and um, I've worked in a lot of animal protection organizations, um, mostly as a lawyer suing factory farms for environment, environmental violations. Um, but I will say, so within the last year and a half I've been working on this, this has been new to me. I've learned a lot. Um, and so I kind of see all of you probably where I was a year and a half ago. So please feel free to interrupt if you, if you have any questions. Um, so let me, I'm going to share my screen and, oh, I need access to be able to share my screen. Uh. Give me one second. Okay. okay. All these new Zoom uh, privacy controls. Great. Okay. Can you can you see that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then you'll see me. All right. Well, so this is uh, this is a new initiative, and we're called the Material Innovation Initiative. And let's see. This is what I'm going to go over today. So I'll go over a little bit about who we. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Sorry. No problem. Uh, so this is we're going to go over who we are. Uh, you'll see some EA principles in here. So um, why our work's important, what the current market looks like, the opportunities for growth, why this issue is tractable, meaning that we can affect change quickly, and that this space is uncrowded. There's really not many other groups working on this issue. So here's who we are. So you, you heard a little bit about my background that um, I actually come from the Good Food Institute. If um, I'm assuming everybody's heard of the Good Food Institute, the I develop and ran all of the Good Food Institute's international programs. So everything that was outside of the US. So we, we started operations in India, China, Brazil, Europe, and Israel. And I oversaw all of those operations. So anything in science and technology, innovation, communications, working with big companies and investors. And I'm sure all of you've seen how hugely successful the Good Food Institute was. And so a little over a year ago, Stephanie Downs, my co-founder, approached me with the idea to create the GFI for vegan materials. So this is where the new meat landscape was in 2016. So when the Good Food Institute started, this is what the industry looked like. And this was three years later. Huge, huge growth because of their programs. Now there's a lot of groups who are working in this space, but they were really able to jumpstart the entire industry. 
um, we calculated that there's about a 1200% increase in companies and other players working in new protein. Um, and that was really because of their programs. And so we thought, why do something different? Why not just copy what they did and we'll do it for the fashion, automotive and home goods industries. So this is what us, this is the Material Innovation Initiative, basically GFI for vegan materials. Um, our goal is to help create new leather, silk, wool, down, fur, and exotic skins. That's generally from like crocodiles or pythons, some things like stingrays, and ostriches, um, and make them animal free and more sustainable. And we do that by being the center of an, the ecosystem. So we work with scientists, entrepreneurs, brands, innovators, and investors to identify high impact areas for new research and creating new companies. So where do we need to focus? What will have the highest impact? And then we put our resources there. Um, and so not only are we a think tank in analyzing where we think there needs to be the most resources, but then we actually come in and help affect change. So for example, will we go out and give presentations to serial entrepreneur groups? So say, look, here's the opportunity for the space. Not only can you make money by creating a new company here, but you can also affect positive social change. Doing the same with investors, right? Investors are now looking for the next beyond meat of the material world, helping to connect them to these new investment opportunities, these new companies. And then also working with scientists. So we're working with scientists in a lot of different disciplines um, to ensure that they understand the value of working in materials. So for example, we've been talking to a couple different scientists who who 3D print human skin for burn victims or who grow human skin in, in labs and help them understand that technology is very similar to growing bovine skin. And there's a lot of opportunity for them to work in this area too. And then we do work with big brands. Um, I'll show you later some of the big brands we've been working with, but I've been very excited about how much the fashion and automotive industry is really ready for this change. Um, we haven't had so much contact with the home goods industry, but at least with fashion and automotive, they are ready. Now we do get this question a lot. I'm not sure this is a, you know, the EA group will have it as much, but why can't industry do it on its own, right? If there are materials out there, there are companies who are interested, why do we need to use philanthropy? Why do we need a nonprofit working in this, in this area? And so we have this nice little graphic of a gondola where if we just went with traditional industry, it's going to take a long time to get there. Um, but with our programs, we can really fast track innovation and get these materials to market a lot quicker. So I want to go over why this is an important issue. Um, and I think what I've heard from a lot of people who are in the space already, who understand the value of moving away from animal agriculture in food, they always ask, why should we move? Isn't this a byproduct, right? Take leather for an example. Why should we focus on leather? Why aren't we focusing on beef? And what I will say is two things. One, margins in animal agriculture are very small. So, it, and um, how to put this? This is hard when it's not interactive. Um, I'm sure most of you have read the Rethink X report on food and agriculture. If you haven't, I really recommend it. Um, we've been working with them to analyze the impact of the material industry on animal agriculture. And what they believe is because margins in animal agriculture are so low that things like leather and wool are actually propping up 
the, the meat industry. Um, and if we can move away from leather, which I believe we can, and we'll go into that a little bit later, why it's so tractable, that we can actually undercut the beef industry. So here, here's something that I learned in, the, in getting into this space. For 72% of a brand's total environmental impact comes from raw materials. So when you think of everything that a fashion brand does that has a negative impact on the environment, the biggest impact comes from their choice of raw materials. So if we wanna make a change in this area, this is where we need to focus. And then if we look at all of the raw materials that brands use, animal materials are actually the worst. So four out of five of the top environmentally damaging materials come from animals. So you can see here, silk is the worst, alpaca wool is second, cow leather is third, then there's cotton, and then traditional wool is fifth. And now if we compare the impact from traditional animal materials to the what we're calling next gen alternatives, there, there's a huge difference. So compared to traditional leather, synthetic leather emits four times more greenhouse gas emissions um, and six times more greenhouse gas emissions than plant-based leather. So if you're wondering, should we use a petroleum-based leather? it is better than traditional cow leather. And as you can see, plant-based leather is significantly better. And then into the animal welfare. Um, a significant number of animals are harmed every year for their, for materials. So as an EA group, um, I think most people don't know about silkworms, right? So, over 1 trillion caterpillars are boiled alive every year for their, for their silk. Um, and if you think about it, this is, this is what you know, we've all seen in animal agriculture. It's trying to cut costs as much as possible in order to make the most profit. So even though you can create silk by allowing the silkworms to emerge from the cocoon, they don't do that, they boil them alive within the cocoon so that there's no breakage of that thread and they can pull off that thread all in, in one strand. And then with leather, actually a lot of people ask me, isn't leather a byproduct? We don't want to waste. So if we're killing the animals for meat, why, why throw away those hides? Why not use them for, for another purpose? And I will say from an environmental standpoint, it's actually much better to let those hides biodegrade. Um, it, there's so much chemicals, I think it's over 250 chemicals that are used in transferring, in creating a hide, in creating leather out of a hide. So if you think about it, right, a hide is skin. If you left it out, um, it's just going to naturally biodegrade. Leather, needs to be durable. It needs to survive. It needs to, to become shoes. It needs to become bags. Um, in order to actually make it that durable so that it can last for decades off of the animal, there's a lot of chemicals that go into that, into that process. And then other questions we hear about wool animals is they, they are really harmed. Number one, they do not need to be sheared. Um, their, their hair will fall off naturally. And the, the workers in wool production facilities are paid by the volume, not by the animal. So they try and go through those animals as quickly as possible and they get massive lash, lacerations in their, um, on their skin. Um, and it's really traumatic. And then actually the lamb industry is a byproduct of the wool industry. So I've been to a number of uh, wool farms out in California, and they say they cannot maintain a profitable business without sending half of the lambs every year for slaughter for lamb. 
And then all of us are now are stuck at home because of, of the pandemic. And I'm sure you know that most infectious diseases come from, from animals, um, including COVID-19. And even now there's, COVID has actually, has changed within the, the mink population in both Oregon now and in Denmark. So it's mutated within the minks and then jumped back to humans. So we really need to stop all forms of industrial animal agriculture. So here's a little bit about the current market. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly, um, but I wanted to put out a landscape like you've seen in the plant-based meat industry. For, for leather, there are quite a few alternatives. This doesn't mean that they actually meet industry needs. There's probably about five companies right now that are producing material that we believe will meet industry needs. Um, and then there's less in silk. There are a few promising companies, but really not enough to take over the entire industry. Um, there's even less in wool, less in fur, and no, there's, there's more in down. And I will say from an EA perspective, we are the least focused on down. We do think a lot of there, there's a lot of really good alternatives for down at the moment. And then there's none in exotic skins. And if you are interested in learning more about these individual companies, all of these landscapes are on our website, which is materialinnovation.org. So there's a lot of opportunity for new companies in this space. So here's the business problem. In order to actually replace materials on the market and make them valuable to both brands and consumers, they need to meet four qualifications. They need to meet the quality that industry needs for those materials. So think about it with a, with a leather. It needs to be able to repel moisture, right? It needs to be durable when it's in a bag or a shoe. Obviously it needs to be at price parity. So some brands are able to spend more than traditional leather if it meets other qualifications, like is significantly more sustainable. But right now the price is very high for these alternative materials. And then third, we need to be at scale, right? There are some companies who, who are producing materials, but they have small productions. And if we really wanna take over the animal material industry, we need to scale significantly. And then finally, sustainability. I will say we've been in a lot of conversations with big brands. They, in general, do not care about animals, but they do care about the environment. And so they will move into these alternative materials when they meet all four of these factors. Um, and there's always ways to improve on sustainability. Sustainability isn't something where, you know, you just check a box and you're done. For us, we're always trying to innovate and encourage the companies to become more and more sustainable. And there's a huge potential market. So this is the type of information that we show to investors or companies who are considering getting into this space. Because the goal is to take over the, in, the entire leather market, for example. But right now, the next gen materials industry is very, very small. Now, our entire goal is to create more competition. Because the more competition in the space, the better the products, the lower the prices, and the higher the volume. So here's an example of Impossible Foods. So in 2017, the Impossible Burger was introduced into high-end New York restaurants for $20 a burger. Within two years, it was available in White Castle for $2. Um, there, there's a number of reasons for that. You know, it is, it is quite complicated, but that's the goal. The more companies who are in the space, the more money in the space, um, the more scientific research we have in the space, 
the better we'll be able to solve all the problems in the industry and the quicker we'll be able to lower the price of the products. And so our theory of change is actually very similar to the Good Food Institute, that we believe consumers just want materials that's beautiful, that's cheap, and that they can buy them in wherever they go to buy their products, right? The same as the Good Food Institute. People want food that tastes good, that's cheap, and is accessible. And so as long as we can get these products down to price parity, they meet consumer needs and they're available wherever you buy your shoes and bags and, and you know, other goods, we believe consumers will buy them. So here's an EA principle that, that I hope you've all heard of, which is tractability. So we define tractability as a cause in which there are definite opportunities for progress backed by widely accepted theory or a track record of success. So the idea is to put your energy, to put your money behind projects that actually can affect change quickly. And we've looked at tractability in three areas, with brands, with consumers, and with barriers to entry. So for brands, we have talked to over 40 international fashion and automotive companies. Now this is, this is just a few of them and I, and I hope you recognize some of them. They are really top names in the industry. And some of these I'm really shocked that they are interested in these alternative materials. Right. So these brands, number one, we got in the door with their top executives very quickly. They are really interested in working on these alternative materials. The issue is, like we've talked about today, the current opportunities on the market don't meet their needs. And so, so let's see, out of the 40 brands we've talked to, only two were not interested. One was a fast fashion brand. And in general, you know, they try and have their, their products are as cheap as possible. They realize that they aren't gonna be able to get into this market quickly. Um, and then one other brand was doing it already on their own. So they didn't think they needed our help. But 38 of them are actively ready to switch to these next gen materials once they're available. Right. And this is really a B2B business, right? So once a material company has a product that meets the brand's needs, as long as the brand's willing to use that, they will. Right. So that's, that to me is very exciting. And if you have experience in the food industry, think about it. Think about if, you know, four or five years ago that Burger King was out actively looking for, you know, plant-based burgers that would have completely changed the entire trajectory of the plant-based food movement. Um, but they weren't, right? It took a lot of effort to convince them that consumers wanted these products. Luckily, we don't have to do that. The brands are actually ready for it. And now with consumers, we actually see consumer preferences very different in the material space than we do in food. So I have a little joke up here. I'm sure you've heard, I just can't give up cheese. I know personally for me, that was the last thing I gave up. And I actually made a lot of excuses why I needed to continue eat cheese. There was actually like a two year period. I, I grew up in Germany. So there's a two year period where I said to myself, oh, I saw cows outside in Germany. They were really, they were happy, right? There's happy cows in Europe. So I would only buy European cheeses. Um, cheese is very hard to give up. It's, it's addictive, right? You never hear people say, oh, I just can't give up my wool. Oh, I just can't give up my leather, right? Consumers are open to these alternatives. In addition, it's not, it's not a cultural um, attribute, right? So many people have cultural connections to food. It's a decision that they make three times or more a day. That's not true for materials. And in fact, most people have alternative materials in their homes already, and they may not be even aware about it. Um, and then we did, oh, and then for technology, 
consumers are skeptical of having technology in their food. Consumers are not skeptical of having technology on their clothes, in their homes, in their cars. In many ways, it's, it's encouraged. People want technology in those areas. And so we did two consumer research studies, one in the United States and one in China. And here's some of the results. And I will say I was actually really shocked at how much consumers were interested in these alternative materials. And you can see in the little in the lower left hand side, these are completely random. This wasn't us sending it to our friends or people within you know, the nonprofit world. This was completely random. Um, and in the US, 76% of consumers said they would likely purchase leather grown via cellular cultivation. And in China, that was 80%. Um, compared to what happened in the plant-based food industry, that it's almost three times the numbers we saw in the beginning. And then 55% of consumers would prefer purchasing a leather alternative, which is really high. Of those, 47% would do it because of animal welfare concerns, 29% because of environmental concerns, and then at least 58% of consumers said they would pay at least 10% more for these leather alternatives. And then you can see below for the Chinese study, it's, it was actually higher. Um, and a lot of these brands, they are focused on US and, and Chinese consumers. So this is, this is really exciting to have both the brands and consumers looking for these alternative materials and excited for them. They just don't exist yet. And then finally, um, there are very little barriers to entry. So again, this is some context from the food industry. And I don't know if everyone saw the news from Singapore. Um, I'm really thrilled to see it because I was actually working on that a couple years ago. Um, Singapore yesterday approved cultivated meat for public consumption. Um, and that's been something we've been worried about in the food industry for years. In the US, it's the FDA and the USDA. Um, but there's a lot more regulations on food than there are in materials. And so for us, we don't have these barriers to entry. There are, there are laws like flammability regulations that everybody needs to meet. There's nothing spe specific for these next gen materials. So we actually do see it a lot easier to get these products to market than food. And then finally, when thinking about where you should donate your time or where you should give your money, you should really be considering you know, how crowded the space is, how many people are in that, how many organizations are, are in it. And so a cause is generally uncrowded if it's undervalued by society or there's a shortage of actors. Um, so number one, we are, if I had to focus on one material, we are mostly focused on silk, not only because it has the highest environmental impact, but we're talking about the most number of animals, one trillion silkworms that are boiled alive every year. There are very few groups who are working on insects, on protecting insects. Um, and then in the fashion industry, there's nobody who's focused on replacement to animal materials. So there are some nonprofits that are working on analyzing the um, environmental impact of materials, but every material, and they have very little information about the environmental impact of these next gen materials. Or there's, there's organizations that are like incubators or accelerators working on developing you know, new innovations for the fashion industry. But there's a lot more that they're working on than just even materials. For example, recycling technology is something that, that the fashion industry is really focused on. And so there, real, there is nobody who's in this space focused on developing new materials that replace animal materials um, and are better for the environment and have you know, no animal ingredients. 
so that's that's a material innovation initiative. Thank you, thank you so much for for listening to the presentation. And um, as a you know EA group, I I would assume there's there's lots of questions. Awesome, thank you so so much for that, Nicole. Um, and yeah, uh, people, please send in your questions in the chat. Um, we are ready to answer them. Or well, I'm not. <laughs> and Cameron put in the uh, the Rethink X report. Yeah, thank you so much, Cameron. And actually, the exciting thing about that too is we are working with them to do a analysis on how specifically we're focused on leather right now. But how does the leather industry you know, impact the, the meat industry? Um, and does it, if we do want to end the beef industry, their argument right now is we need to focus on, on leather for some of these reasons I outlined today, that it's a lot easier to convince industry and consumers to move away from leather than it is beef. Um, a couple questions. Nicole, sorry, do you, oh, I just was gonna ask, are you, sure, are you comfortable with recording the Q&A as well? Yeah, no, and I'm fine. I mean, we, we are very open. We actually just won a GuideStar uh, award, top award for transparency. So feel free to ask me anything. You want to ask about our finances? You want to ask about our hiring plans? You want to ask me what my salary is? It's all open. <laughs> um, well, I, I hit a question myself and then we'll get to the questions in the chat. But I was just wondering quickly if there's any um, overlap it, it seems like the answer is no but if there's any overlap between the like cellular um alternatives um sort of work in the meat space um and like like does that technology like transfer at all to this work or are and are the groups that are doing that at all focused on this yet um or yeah yeah no excellent question yes there is right so with um and I can go into a little bit more of the different technologies if anyone's interested, but there's really two that we're excited about. There's cultivated technology, which is I think what you're talking about. It's taking the cells of an animal and growing them in a lab. Now you can do that just as easily with muscle cells as you can skin cells, right? And so we're also trying to expand the definition of alternative protein, because what we're working on is collagen right, which is mostly, mostly what we're working on is collagen, it's a protein, right? And so the same technologies that we use to grow, you know, a protein, a muscle cell can be used to grow skin. And then another, and so there, and this is those um, on our website and on um, those landscapes that I showed today, those actually aren't all the companies. So some of the cultivated meat companies we've talked to are also looking at growing cultivated leather. One example is Mark Post, I'm sure everyone's heard of, um, who founded Mosa Meats. He has a new company. And then some of the Israeli companies are as well. Okay, awesome, very cool. More optimistic than I was thinking. <laughs> um, uh, all right, so we have a bunch of questions. Um, First, uh, how are you helping advance the sciences needed to develop these materials? Yeah, so first step, we actually just got a $200,000 grant from the Open Philanthropy Project to hire a scientist. Um, I know, it makes such a difference. So I'm a lawyer, um, I can do a lot, not science, that is not my area of expertise. So we really needed a scientist to come on board. So first step, we're trying to hire somebody. So if anyone knows anyone, the job description is on our website. I'd love for you to send it out. Um, so that's the first step. Then second, it's a couple different things. So developing partnerships with universities who are working in this area. So for example, I mentioned um, some things, uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, we're working with two two scientists there who grow human skin. Um, another scientist at Renslauer Polytechnic, and then actually a silk scientist at Renslauer as well. Um, so really helping scientists who have experience in this area understand that their skills are also transferable to materials. Other things we're doing in science and technology 
don't know if everyone's heard of the, the GFI grant program. Within the last two years, they've given out $7 million in open, research for open source, for open source research in alternative um, food technology. We're looking at doing the exact same thing. So right now we're looking for funding to hire somebody to run that program. And our development directors are already talking to, to donors who wanna to give to those programs. We are also writing reports. So actually on our website, if you're interested in mycelium technology, we have a technology assessment on mycelium leather, which talks about how you grow mycelium leather, what the environmental impact is, because our brand, what we've done is looked at, you know, who are the decision makers, you know, and how do we convince them to change? And so when we're talking to brands, it's about convincing them these alternative materials meet their performance standards, like we talked about quality and sustainability standards. So when you look at all of our technology assessments, we go through all of those different qualifications. So they're really excited about this space. Um, I think those are the, the main things we're doing right now in science and technology. Awesome. Um, okay, we have a bunch of questions about the silk, uh, focus on silk. Um, so given your focus on silk, um, the question is how are you determining whether insects are morally relevant um, or not? And yeah, um, actually, I'll maybe just read out all the questions about silk in case like the answers kind of uh, overlap. Uh, it's also a question about um, there's something, there's some sort of silk called humane silk, which doesn't involve boiling the worms. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Um, and why is silk um, so environmentally detrimental in particular? Okay, so I'll start with those. Um, yeah, so let me start with whether silk are, silkworms or caterpillars are morally relevant. There was, a, there was an article recently that talked about whether that stage that the silkworm is in, in its development, um, whether they can actually feel pain. Um, I don't know, and I think that's a really good question. And there's actually, I don't know if, um, if anyone does care more about insects, Abraham Rove has a really great newsletter on insects that I recommend. Um, he works at Rethink X Priorities, Rethink Priorities, sorry. Um, I think it's a really good question. The way we are operating right now is we just need to assume that they do feel pain and we do need, we need to assume that they feel sentient because why not, right? That my perspective is, you know, they're, they're living, moving, breathing creatures who eat and operate like other living creatures. And um, there are studies that show that they do, they do feel pain. And so the potential for harm, if we're wrong, is really high. So we'd rather err on the side of caution and assume right now that they are, they do feel pain and are sentient. Um, but there, there are some really good articles out there talking about that. Um, and then I think another one was why is silk so environmentally detrimental? Um, there's a lot of different issues. The biggest one is actually the use of water. So right now, silkworms really only eat mulberry leaves and mulberry trees are highly water intensive. Um, and so there's a lot of water use in that process and then with the boiling throughout the process as well. Um, that's, that's what I've been told is the, is the biggest one. And actually, if anybody is interested, we have a couple reports that aren't in final version on the, uh, it's a sustainability assessment on silk and a sustainability assessment on leather that I'm happy to share. We just haven't publicized them yet. Um, that goes into a lot more of those details. Um, and then let's see the other questions. Oh, the Ahimsa silk. That's the name for the silk where the, the caterpillar is actually allowed to emerge from the cocoon. It's a really, really small percentage of the entire silk industry. And actually, I think it was Abraham who sh either shared this or wrote this up 
that they did an analysis of the silkworms, the number of silkworms killed in that industry, and it was actually higher. Um, and now I can't remember exactly why, but there is a really good article on that. Um, so number one, it is really small. And then unfortunately, there, there are significant problems with that. Um, okay. Uh, okay awesome. Yeah, I, I think that was all three of the questions I asked. I also missed a question also about silk. So just gonna ask that. Um, uh, just a question about how uh, you guys prioritize silk relative to the other materials you talked about. Yeah, so it's really interesting because the technology, like how we spend our time actually overlaps a lot between the different materials. Um, so like I mentioned before, down, we really aren't focused on. You can kind of take that out for now because there are a lot of good alternatives. Um, that doesn't mean we won't eventually, but we don't think it's the highest use of our priorities. Exotic skins is skin, right? So it's a very similar technology to leather. The difference is you need a little bit different, um, you need to create a different pattern on the top, which is a slightly different technology, but in general, the vast majority is the same. And then for the other materials, if you think about it, they're all strands. So silk, fur, and wool, it's hair, right? It's like a hair or a thread. And so that technology can be very similar with fur kind of having a combination of the thread and the leather underneath. Um, so right now that's it, the technology is very similar. And then we've been focused mostly on specific types of technology. So like I mentioned, precision fermentation and cultivation are the ones we're most excited about. So for anyone who doesn't know what precision fermentation is, you take something like the collagen of whatever species you want. So let's just use bovine. We take bovine collagen, you put that into bacteria or yeast. And then that bacteria and yeast grows and replicates that collagen. Um, and collagen makes up about 80% of, of skin cells. Um, and so, so that technology is very exciting, but you can use that not only for leather, but silk as well. Um, there, we haven't seen so much development in wool, but theoretically we feel like that could work in wool as well. Um, I don't know, whoever asked that question, I don't know if that fully answers your question, um, but we're really mostly focused on the scientific development. Hey Nicole, that was my question. Um, sorry, um, I was so that's a really encouraging answer. I'm curious if that changes if you know these technologies develop to the point where um, the sorts of things you would have to do to develop leather versus develop silk, um, at the, if those were different at that point, um, how would you go about deciding where to place your efforts? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. So I will share this as something I don't think a lot of people think about when you're getting into nonprofits or giving to nonprofits. Um, our funders do play a big role in some of that as well. So I will say when we got the $200,000 from Open Philanthropy Project, that is restricted for silk and fur. Right, so that, that scientist who we're bringing on for that position is supposed to be exclusively working on silk and fur. Right, now, like I mentioned, some of their work will have positive impacts in the other materials as well, um, but that is where we are focused right now on for that technology. I would love to hire another scientist who's focused on, on leather too, but we need to find that money and you know, hiring people is pretty expensive. Um, but I do think that long term, this is what I love about the EA movement is we're just constantly reevaluating, right? That right now, this is our theory of change. This is what we are prioritizing. That might change next year, right? So if we see, you know, hypothetically within the next year, we see a ton of development in silk alternatives and there's nothing in wool. Right, even though significantly less animals are killed for wool, um, there's we could reevaluate and say, you know what, we think the industry is in a point right now where 
we've jump started it, it can continue. We need to put our efforts in somewhere else. Um, so I do think, you know, we will just keep reevaluating. Um, Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Uh, just got another question about down. Um, so uh, while there are good alternatives to down, their adoption still seems pretty low. Um, why did you decide to focus on um, developing new materials rather than promoting broader adoption of the existing down alternatives? Yeah, it's a really good question. And we actually get that a lot for a number of different materials, like leather as well, where they're, I'm sure everyone has synthetic leathers at home too, right? So all my shoes are synthetic leather, right? My car is synthetic leather, you know, my bed is all alternative down, right? But the issue is the industry is not using them, right? That's, I think what we need, to, when we look at where we can affect the most change, Industry knows about these alternatives, take down or the leather, and they're not using them. There's a couple different reasons for that. Um, one is, like we talked about before, the price, the quality, or the sustainability. Um, and so when we're looking at these next gen alternatives, they're significantly better in sustainability on everything. Um, and I could go into the, the details of each, but we're looking at over 90% better in water use, chemical use, land use, end of life, um, and emissions. Um, so industry is concerned right now about the environmental impact of those alternatives that are on the market right now, even though they're cheaper. And so we don't see it as being very effective in trying to convince industry what's out there right now I mean, when you talk about these big brands, they have huge teams of sourcing experts. That was a new term to me a year ago, um, who basically go out there and source the materials for their designs for that year. They're aware of all of this and they're just not using it. And so what we feel like we're more effective when we're out promoting and creating these new materials that can meet all four of those factors that they're looking at. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> and question. Uh, so beyond is beyond meat is obviously publicly traded like um, alternative meat company. Are there any materials companies that are publicly traded? Um, ask yes. because it's looking for stock picks. So not yet. And I think there really needs to be. There was um, um, there was a new Oh my goodness, my um, investment terminology is going to fail me here. But um, there is a new, Sebastiano um, Costalini, I think, created a new fund where you can actually buy shares that um, own, again, they're publicly traded companies, but you don't have to put all of your money in one company. There are companies right now who are creating, they're chemical companies that are creating better synthetic leathers, but, you know, they're chemical companies. So I can give you some names for those, like um, Torre is one of them. Ultra Fabrics is another one. They're both Japanese companies. Both have a alternative leather material that is now 30% bio-based. So we believe in helping promote alternatives that are better. We think we need to move away from petroleum long-term we do not think that any of these alternatives should be using petroleum in the long run, but as long as the, they're constantly improving, we're willing to support them. But no, I hope so. I hope there's gonna be the next Beyond Meat. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna be conflicted out of investing in them, but everybody else can. Um, but if, if I hope soon, we'll see the industry growing really quickly. Yeah, hopefully that day comes soon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question uh, in the chat. Uh, so is there a concept of managed retreat, for example, like compensation schemes for those um, currently employed in the silk industry so that there's less resistance from those groups that are invested in the current state of things? Um, and I just want to add to this question, like I think uh, I'm 
feel like you're probably familiar with uh, Leah Garces, Garces's work, uh, kind of doing something similar with chicken farmers um, and like working directly with them to help them get out of the industry. So, yeah. Yeah, actually, since you mentioned MFA, I'll mention that we are working with their, their it's called the Transformation Project, like transformation, but add farm in the middle. Um, I think it's brilliant. I really do. Um, and if anyone hasn't seen her TED Talk, I highly recommend it. Um, it does make sense to work with industry to help affect change. Um, not only because that's easier, right? Let's convince industry to get on board, but we also don't want to have negative externalities, right, on people. I don't have anything against the people working in the silk industry, you know, and that was the example. There's actually a lot of child labor in these industries, a lot of indentured slave labor and um, really terrible working conditions. We didn't even get into that today, all the, the human impact from these industries, but we really do want to try and affect positive change. I will say we have talked to um, the fur industry. They are not interested in talking to us or, or changing. Um, the wool industry is actually fairly similar. Most people do look at wool as being very natural product. Um, and so we've had some struggles with that. Leather is open. I will say there's actually a few leather companies, one in particular who I haven't seen it, but they told me that they actually have a lab where they're looking at creating these um, cultivated leathers. Um, so I think the leather industry is seeing what's happened in the meat industry and is willing to change. And then think about it too, they're interconnected, right? So if our demand for, for beef goes down, that just means that the price for leather is going to either go up, right? Or there's going to be, there's going to be less leather. So things that we are also doing to work with industry, like I mentioned, the transformation project, and then we're working with, with GFI as well. Um, is figuring out ways to add more profit to plant-based agriculture. So one example from the transformation project. So specifically, MFA is working on transitioning chicken farmers to hemp production, right? So their chicken, the, the buildings, they can actually grow hemp in them fairly easily. The issue is it's only the top one foot of a six foot plant that is used for the hemp production. The rest is basically waste. So that's where the materials industry can come in and say, we can purchase that, right, the other, you know, five, six of the plant and figure out how to turn those stalks and leaves into a material. And that's the thing that's really nice is there's so much opportunity to take that waste from the food industry or other, you know, plant agriculture because it doesn't need to be eaten, right? It, it can be turned into something else. And I'm sure everyone's seen, there's already like hemp cotton replacements. We can turn that hemp into even a leather replacement. And then we've been working with GFI to do something similar. So most of the alternative meats right now are pea protein based. But you take the peas, you don't use the rest of the plant. So again, we can find a opportunity for those pea farmers to make more money by selling their stocks and leaves to the materials industry. So those are some examples of the way we're working with industry. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, the kind of like working mm -hmm. with the alternative foods to try and make those cheaper. Uh, that's not something I would have thought about. Um, all right, another question. I, I don't actually know what this one is asking, but I hope that you do. Um, what are other important aspects in the carcass balancing problem that you think are neglected? Um, is that, so I have a, I have a follow-up question for that. So are you talking about the extra pieces of the carcass that are not used in food production or like leather production? So that, hi, that was my question. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't. So I can tell you if you take the profit from a cow, 5% of that profit is leather, 5% is the rest, right? So whether it's, you know, forgive me for the graphic terms, but blood and guts and bones and brains, um, that the rest of that is 5%. 
and then about 90% of it is meat. Um, the, the other, like the bones and other things can be made into other materials and do go into other parts of, they are sold off. That's just not an area where we're focused. Um, maybe eventually. We're trying to start with like a lean startup model and just laser focus in this area. But if this, if we're really successful, there's a lot of other areas that we could get into. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I see that we are running a little bit past time. Um, do you have a little bit more time to answer questions or we can wrap up more quickly? Yeah, actually, I, for some reason, I have this on my calendar till 530. So I've got, or yeah, I'm in California. I've got plenty of time. Okay, cool. Not going anywhere tonight. <laughs> um, all right. So next question. Um, it's encouraging to hear that fashion companies care so much about sustainability. Um, is that the product of consumer demand? And if so, has that changed your estimate of the relative value of consumer persuasion versus tech development? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because we have not been focused on consumer persuasion at all. Like with our theory of change, um, it's consumers buy animal products despite the animal, right? They don't purchase them because they want to kill an animal. They purchase it because it's available, right? It's cheap and, you know, beautiful, durable, you know, whatever that quality is. If it's wool, it keeps you warm. And so our theory is that if the product on the market meets all of those needs, but just doesn't come from an animal, consumers aren't gonna care right? Even more so than I think in the food industry. And so we see our biggest audience um, to convince to change the, the brands, right? The, we, we think of ourselves as a B to B to C. So we're a business that serves a business that then serves consumers. So we need to understand what the consumers want so that we can better serve our clients, the business, right? But we're really focused on working with the businesses um, we have done that consumer research, like I showed you, just because it was a really simple project and helped us understand any challenges that the brands might be facing, right? So when we talk to them, we can really understand how they're seeing the world or present them with data that might help convince them that maybe they're not seeing the world in, in the way we want them to. Um, so I'm forgetting the whole question. Did that, did that answer everything? part of that. Sorry, I'm on mute. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Oh, versus um, tech or, oh, sorry, the relative value of consumer persuasion versus tech development. So the tech. Yeah. yeah, so and if you look at, I mean, what we tried to do was go through and evaluate all areas where we could be working, right? And then where is there the most opportunity for change? And where could we affect change the quickest? And I do think that the tech development makes the most sense. So if you look, there's probably about 70 companies who are producing these next gen materials. And like I mentioned, there's really only a handful that we think could meet industry needs at the moment. And again, they're not perfect, right? There's, there's issues with them, but they are significantly better than traditional leather, for example, or synthetic leather. Um, we just see a lot of opportunity for development in the technology, whether it's, and let, let me give you an example. So one of the products on the market right now that you could go out and buy is called Pina Tex, right? So it's the base is made from pineapple, pineapple waste. Um, and it's, it's on the market. They've been on the market for the longest. The problem is it's actually coated in a petroleum based product, right? There is no plant-based non-petroleum coating for these type of materials. Now, if we want to move away from petroleum-based products, right, um, we, want, we don't want to use fossil fuels anymore, that is a huge area for development, right? And a lot of people are against using more things that they consider plastics. So we see that as a big opportunity, and it doesn't take a lot of work, right? For us, it's let's analyze all the opportunities and then let's just get the, the information out there, right? When we go present to entrepreneurs or investors or scientists at universities, 
it's really adding, oh, there's an opportunity to create more research in codings. And just providing that idea makes a huge difference. Um, so we see that the time, the resource commitment is low, but the impact's very high. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, next question. Uh, when considering the scale of suffering and the crowdedness of each field, how would you estimate the effectiveness of pursuing a career in or directing donations towards uh, synthetic materials versus cultivated meat? It's interesting. So I will say something that I don't think, I think it's part of the EA movement, but something that I personally think we don't put enough effort in is what you're interested in. Like, I really do strongly believe that people are more effective when they get up in the morning and absolutely love their jobs, right? We were actually, I had a strategic planning session this morning with one of my team, and somebody on the East Coast was joking how somebody in California, not me, um, was up at 5.50 in the morning calling him because she wanted to do um, the donation receipts from Giving Tuesday. 5.50 in the morning, she's up and she's like, I need to do donation receipts because she was super excited about her job. And that actually goes a long way in being effective. So I think number one, I will just say that picking something that you absolutely love doing um, is really important. And then I would say in synthetic materials versus cultivated meat, there is so much money, so many people who are in the food industry right now there's huge opportunities for development. I don't think we need to stop in that area, but there's nowhere near that amount in materials. And I think it's really hard to judge ultimate effectiveness, right? When you talk about like the tractability, how quickly we can get something to market. I personally believe that we're all gonna have vegan materials quicker than we're all gonna be eating vegan food three meals a day. Right, it's just so much easier to convince consumers and brands to move away. Um, so we personally see a lot of value in ending those industries to potentially then have a snowball effect into other industries like the food industry. Um, and people have asked us that question as well when you're talking about animal, the impact on animal lives, right? What happens if we end the beef industry? Like best case scenario, right? We are, we are awesome. We do an amazing job in leather. And, you know, because now nobody wants to use leather from animals, the beef industry really falls because they don't have that profit. What's, what's a natural next step with that? Are people going to now eat more fish and chicken? Possibly, right? If they're not eating beef, maybe they are going to move to fish and chicken. Um, but I also think there's a huge value. If we end a particular industry, other industries are going to get a lot more worried, right? So if then we're going to, and, and what I will say too is like animal agriculture is always going to try and find more profit. There are now um, fish scales. They're taking the byproduct of the fish industry, making leather out of it. Right. And you can imagine it would be beautiful, right? Fish scales are beautiful. Um, that's a problem, right? So that that is also propping up the leather industry. It's very small at the moment, but I see that as a similar path to insect protein, where insect protein was actually a pretty small industry just a few years ago, but there's more and more interest in that, which again is huge issues with, with suffering, you know, if we're assuming that insects are sentient. Um, so if we can end, you know, the beef industry, then it's a lot easier for us to go to everybody else and say, look, you, you need to diversify your products. You need to not only, you know, you need to move away from wool, but you also need to have synthetic wool or next gen wool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, I think the, these, we have three more questions left and then we're gonna probably end the uh, talk. Um, so, uh, next question, uh, which nations are most involved in production, consumption, exportation, and importation 
of animal-based clothing, automotive, and home goods? Um, excellent question, and we're still trying to answer that. Um, and and in it, if anybody's interested, oh, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat too, so everybody has it. Um, it's, and for anyone listening, it's Nicole R. for Rawling at materialinnovation.org. Um, if you forget that, you can find me on LinkedIn or just send us, send us a message through the online system because that comes to me anyway. Um, we do have three market reports that analyze all of these questions for leather, silk, and wool. And then we've also started to collect it for um, exotic skins. And our team is tiny. We actually only have two full-time people at the moment. So um, we're, we're growing and that's an area we need to work more on. But um, I'm happy to share those market reports with anyone who's interested. But in general, uh, China has the highest production for silk and fur. Um, and then I have to go back and look at everything else to give you an accurate, accurate number. But um, it looks like, Caitlin, that's you. If you do want to email me, I can answer that question afterwards. Thank you. Can actually, can I add a different thought just because I think it's, it's so interesting. We've, and this was my perspective too, in, at the Good Food Institute running the international program. I think it's important to remember that borders aren't, you know, there's not walls at borders, right? And so as long as that demand exists somewhere in the world, somebody's going to produce it, right? And I think that's the problem, right? So right now there's, we've had a lot of wins as a, you know, animal protection industry, especially in Europe and in fur. So like Poland and France are now banning the production of fur. What's going to happen if there's still worldwide demand for fur? Just because they're banned in Poland and France doesn't mean that that production is going to go down. What probably means is that that production is going to move somewhere else that has lower um, animal protection laws, right? So that for us is also why we're looking at the developments in new technology, because that's what we see consistently is that when certain countries start to ban certain products, the production just goes somewhere else. It's right, that's that supply and demand curve. You're always going to meet in the middle. Um, next question. Uh, the vertically integrated sectors of the food industry, um, so chicken and pork, um, have been more receptive to transition than the less integrated sectors like beef. Um, are any of the material sectors similarly vertically integrated? Excellent question. Um, I don't know, but what I can say that's really interesting and especially developments out of COVID is there is a lot of suppliers and you know subcontractors in the material space. So there's very few, and I can actually only think of one brand, and let's just use like leather again as an example, that that owns its own cows. Right? It's um, and what we have seen in COVID is there's a lot of worry about huge supply chains and not being able to control them. And so a lot of companies are really interested in partnering with these material companies and even having a stake in, in them so that they do get those products first and have more control over them. Um, and then in the, in the fashion industry, there's also a lot of focus on transparency. Right, because there's so many subcontractors and there's a lot of concerns about human rights violations, they want to understand more where all of the materials are coming from. And so we're, that's one of our big arguments is that when you work with some of these material companies, you're cutting out huge numbers of subcontractors. Um, and then a number of the material companies are currently in the United States. And so that's something that I don't know the answer to, how that's going to work long term. 
are we going to produce the materials in the United States? They're going to be shipped to manufacturing in China and then shipped back to the United States um, to sell those goods. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so I'm really curious to see how that that's going to change long term. Uh, awesome. And last question. Uh, what is the best way for interested EAs to support uh, your work at Material Innovations Initiative? Yeah, I think a couple of things. I mean, right now, obviously, we're really new, so we could use funds. What I would say right now is we are actively trying to hire, we have the money for our, our science director. We're just trying to find the person, the right person now. I need a director of innovation. So somebody who's really out there working with all of these material companies um, and entrepreneurs and investors, right? Because they're the ones who are going to spark all of this interest in the area. And the thing that shocked me about this, especially being new to the materials industry, is how much we can change the material company's strategy with a very quick discussion and really have a huge benefit for them. And I can give you just two examples. One, actually I talked to a company yesterday that saw their competitor as a synthetic leather, the synthetic leather industry, not animals. And I was like, you're never gonna be at that price point. That's not your competitor. Your competitor is, an, is animal leather, right? And so we've kind of talked through that a bit and that really changes their whole strategy and within half an hour discussion, we can really value, we can add a lot of value to their, their um, strategy. And so I need somebody who's out there talking to everybody and really helping these material companies to advance. So we need $100,000 by the end of the year, we're trying to do that. And then I think with everything else, um, sharing this information, right? I love the fact that you're recording this and the more we can get the information out there, the better. Right, because I think that it's these conversations that we have with people who were never aware of those issues before that can really increase that knowledge um, and excitement about these alternative materials. Awesome. Um, uh, out of curiosity, um, how much of the hundred thousand have you raised that you're trying to raise for the end of the year? Goodness. So I'd have to check in because we got. We got quite a bit, yes, I mean, not quite a bit, isn't that much, but um, I mean, I'm guessing it's more around like 10,000 so far, um, but the way development works, we just have to keep, you know, working those relationships. So we actually do have a couple animal advocates who I think would be giving us more along the lines of a couple more $10,000 gifts. Um, and then we do actually, I have the candidate I wanna hire for that position too. Um, and she's incredible. So I just really need the, the funds to get that going. Um, awesome. But what, we've got, what, 30 days left? Yeah. Days. Uh, well, hopefully we're able to uh, hit that goal. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for your time, Nicole. Um, and thank you so much for sticking around and answering all these questions. Uh, it was so wonderful to have you. Um, this was super fascinating. Uh, to hear about your work and uh, to hear about this whole new uh, kind of sector of animal welfare work that I didn't know about before. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, we'll be sharing the recording on YouTube. So hopefully more people will get to view as well. Um, and feel free to share the recording yourself as well. Oh yeah, we'd love to. And actually, if you want to look, we just published our year in review which I think is a great document to share as well. So if you know anybody who might be interested in learning what we're doing, um, it's on our website and it's through our social media, if you can see it. But um, I'm, I'm, I will say I'm very proud of it. So I'd love if people looked at it. Awesome. So um, we'll share the link in the event for all of you to see after this. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Nicole. Uh, have yeah, a thank you all too. Have a wonderful evening. Bye.